Hello, and welcome to day 91 of Revelation, a Bible study. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. We are continuing in Revelation chapter 20, with verses 7 and 8. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. So for the thousand years of the direct reign of Jesus over the earth, Satan was bound and inactive, but he's going to be released, and he's going to successfully organize many people of the earth in another rebellion against God. Why in the world would that happen? Because Jesus has reigned so wonderfully for the thousand years, then why rebel? Well, we talked about this. The thousand years is to show that even giving some people a utopian atmosphere, think the Waltons with a Christ-driven theme, they will still rebel and do evil. With the millennial kingdom of Jesus, God will give mankind a thousand years of a perfect environment. No Satan, no violence, no crime, no evil, or any other social pathology. But at the end of those thousand years, man will still rebel against God at his first opportunity. One commentator wrote these words. It will be proved once more that man, whatever his advantages and environment, apart from the grace of God and new birth, remains at heart only evil and at enmity with God. Let's continue with Revelation 20 verses 9 to 10. They went up the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and destroyed them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now they went up. Those they are those who survived the great tribulation. They enter the millennial kingdom and their descendants. Another commentator wrote, Infants born during the millennium will live to its conclusion and will not be required to make a choice between the devil and Christ until the end. Now, if you ever read the battles described in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, they clearly take place before the return of Jesus, perhaps right before or during the tribulation. But this final battle clearly takes place at the end of the thousand year reign of Jesus. Nobody can argue that. We don't know if the saints referred to here are glorified saints who reign with Jesus or earth inhabitants who come to faith in Christ during the millennium, but it doesn't matter. Either way, the strategy of this vast satanic army is clearly to destroy God's people and Jerusalem, his beloved city. We shouldn't even call this final battle because there is no battle. At this point, God finally deals with the devil and his followers forever. Satan is judged and tormented forever with the beast and the false prophet who were cast into the lake of fire at the beginning of the thousand years, which is in Revelation 19 verse 20. The presence of the beast and the false prophet in the lake of fire after a thousand years argues against annihilation. They're still in their eternal torment. In eternal punishment, a thousand years is just the beginning. It never ends. One commentator put it this way. There would be no way possible in the Greek language to state more emphatically the everlasting punishment of the lost than here in mentioning both day and night and the expression forever and ever, literally, to the end of the ages of ages. Let's continue with Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. John began the book of Revelation with the throne, and he ends it here with the great white throne. Earth and heaven flee from this throne, but there was found no place for them. There's absolutely no hiding from this throne. Most Bible scholars believe that Christians will never appear before this great white throne because the idea is that we are already spared from this awesome uh, throne of judgment. Our sins have been taken care of by Christ at the cross. We don't escape God's judgment. It's satisfied in Jesus. Our names are inscribed in God's book of life and we are forgiven. It reads that death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. 
This is the last echo of sin on this earth. It's gone. Death is the result of sin. Death is gone. Hades is the result of death. Hades is gone. And sin is gone forever. The bullet points in the paperwork are really interesting. When a person refers to hell, the lake of fire is usually what they have in mind. However, the Bible uses three main points to describe where the ungodly go when they die. Sheol is a Hebrew word. It's the idea of the place of the dead. It really has no reference to either torment or eternal happiness, and its idea is usually best described as just the grave. Hades is a Greek word used to describe the world beyond. In the Bible, it kind of is the same idea as Sheol. Revelation 9.1 speaks of a bottomless pit. That is the place called the Abyssos. It's a, pl a prison for certain demons, and that's located in Luke 8.31, 2 Peter 2.4, and Jude 6. And then finally, there is the word Gehana. It's a Greek word, but it's borrowed from the Hebrew language. You can find that in Mark 9, verses 43 to 44. Jesus used it. Uh, hell is, it's the same as saying hell. Hell is a Greek translation of this this word. The Hebrew had a place called the Valley of Hinnom. It was a place outside Jerusalem's walls. It was desecrated by the worship of Moloch. And that was the God that they used to put children on and beat the drums as a child was being burned alive in sacrifice. We can find that in 2 Chronicles 28, 1 to 3 and Jeremiah 32, verse 35. And it also served as a garbage dump where rubbish and refuge were burned. The smoldering fires and festering worms of the Valley of Hinnom made it a graphic and effective picture of the fate of the damned. This is also used for the lake of fire. That's the word hell. And it's also used for the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels found in Matthew 25 verse 41. Men only go to this place prepared for the devil and his angels if they reject God's salvation. Our prayer of the day. Almighty God, our dear Father, we pray over and over again for the salvation of those we love and the soul that is only moments from eternity without you, even when we don't know that soul. Please, Lord, make us more like Jesus Christ every day, every hour, every minute, so that we are an example to those who will never walk inside the church building. The alternative to life with you in eternity is absolutely un thinkable. And so we pray for that soul closest to death and eternity without you. In Jesus' matchless name, amen.